Okay. There you go. Okay. So, like, hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, thank you, Josh, for having me. That's awesome. Um, it's uh, I think like it's we're living in a very interesting point of time uh, at that point uh, for me and I think for everybody else like around the world to see like this innovations and everything that's kind of coming through um, with like AI it's really hard to keep up at that point I've been doing this for about 16 months now like right now I'm like 100% full, fully dedicated to do AI work um, but um, it's just like at that point it's really hard to keep up with the whole thing that's going on, like uh, there is something new that comes every day. There are a lot of concepts that come every day. A lot of people are trying to implement their ideas and to use AI for um, for their work and to do things. But I don't. I think there's a lot of misconception about how to use an AI. So like AI is just it's just a tool, and this tool will keep on evolving. So like only thinking about the technical aspect, that's something that's not gonna help like, you know, the world or help us like use AI in a very meaningful way. But I think like um, before I start getting into like AI, I think it's a good idea to kind of like introduce myself a little bit. Maybe you will just like talk a little bit about my past and maybe that will lead you into understanding why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I'm an architect and I've, um, I have been, the, I've been doing architecture and design for over like 13 years now at that point. And um, before AI, I did like architecture, construction, I did furniture design, I did museography and exhibition design for like a big part of my life too. But for the big part of my life, I was actually a computational designer. So I used computation to try and like solve engineering problems or create new forms or ideas. That also, that also got me into generative arts and like, you know, generative, generative artworks that is, a little bit like in the oblivion or like the abstract, mainly it's all in the pursuit of like new meanings and like trying to understand what I like about design. It's like throughout my career, the whole question that was centered in my mind that like actually like that's shifting my career is what is good, what is good in general? Like, you know, like whether it's like a moral meaning or like visual meaning or and I've been lost, you know, I, I've uh, been lost into like philosophy, into into art, into design, into engineering's morals, into like, I don't know, capitalism. And I don't know, this actually led me to come here to the United States about five years ago, where I started working as a computational designer in the Lucas Museum of Narrative Arts. And I've been doing uh, so for the past four years. Um, I actually had like more images about the, the museum, but unfortunately like the the presentation crashed. It's, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe I can share some photos with you later. But basically like me worked at a company called Martin Bros, which was one of the, it's one of the biggest construction companies here in Los Angeles. And like I've worked at, as a part of a big computational design team. And I think like our team was very, very, very narrow focused, like not a lot of teams exist like that in the world where we were and like in the middle between architecture and construction. And that's something that not a lot of people actually does, um, you know, in, in their lives, um, or at, at least as architects, you whether you're either like a design an architect or an architect designer, or you are like, you know, an engineer, a civil engineer or something. But what we did was like pretty, really interesting. But it's not only... It, it wasn't only interesting because what I've learned about like construction and fabrication and what it takes to make a building, but actually it was, for me, it was a little bit philosophical. Like why is this building is good? Why are people spending so much money in building these things? Where the value lies? And uh, I just couldn't like escape that question, but nevertheless, I work like 60 and sometimes 20 hours a day. And that actually won't leave you a, a big room to kind of, you know, like wander around and like understand life or ask, ask yourself questions, like philosophical questions. Um, but something really interesting that happened like last year, 2022, which is like this, like the big models, what you call them, like, or like the fusion models started to appear and started to be accessible. So AI was there and it was used in architecture and it was used in art so like generative ai art has been there for about like four or five years now there's a lot of big artists big names that have been using ai before uh the release of the linguist like large linguistic models but like these tools when they appeared they have 
provided something that wasn't there before, which is accessibility and democracy. So now you don't have to be a data scientist. You don't have to have a large like network, like large framing machine to process your like uh, new neural networks. Now you can do this basically on the cloud, or you can have a small, um, you know, small machine, and you can run this on it. Which, and it's also trained on a big data set, something that not a lot of people can get their hands on, on basically. And that actually kind of led me into like uh, I, I I think I first like saw like these big models in February 2022, but then I couldn't start using them before May or June of the same year. And I remember it was like a Saturday uh, Saturday evening and I just didn't know what to do. And then I received an email from a journey like inviting me to um, try their model. And I just like went there. And I remember like when I first saw the first picture, I just like couldn't take it off my mind. It was, it was fascinating. It was something that I've never seen before. And it's actually kind of transforming my life. Um, and one thing led to another, and like starting from January this year, I kind of left my job in like with Martin Bros, was my construction company, and started like 100% having my own design studio, which is based on the integration between AI, architecture, art, and design. Uh, I look at this like I look at this perspective of like using AI and architecture the same way in um, how what the world is are living on right now is formed by. So like most of like the influential forces on architecture are not leading to make like creative uh, decisions. It's basically because we are bounded by like budget, like by our understanding of uh, form and, uh, you know, like, tech, like digital fabrication and uh, geopolitical issues that actually kind of forms the architecture. So architects are not really free to design what they want to design. They are all bounded um, in like, or confined in this like tight space that is called, yeah, we need to build this and we need to build this now. So there's no way, there's no room to innovate. So like very, very handful of architects actually around the world have been able to um, practice like their vision or like practice their ideologies or like speak them out uh, to be seen in the world. One example of that is like, um, or actually like the counter, uh, or like the opposite uh, of that is like Zaha Hadith. And if you see like, this is basically, we're talking about Zaha, so this is like the most influential architect of the 20th century, maybe arguably in the history of architecture, we don't know. But like, again, like what makes Zaha unique is that she let go of all these ideas and all these um, uh, constraints. And she borrowed from like abstract art with something that, no architect have done in that way before. And looking at that, it has transformed the way that architects do right now. So basically like Zaha and Frank Gehry and like a handful of architects have transformed the world into what we know now as the like the post-digital era of architecture. Um, but again, like, and you can see like here, this is the Lucas Museum. So this is the museum that I've, I've been working on, a snapshot of it. And you can see like how this like, paintings from like the uh, early like 20th century has now driven the vision of almost every influential architect that we uh, that we hear about uh, today. So like, again, this is a value that we really need like, to consider and we really need to understand. Uh, okay. It's, for AI, it's uh, not working. Let me try to work the animation. Okay. So yeah, like using AI can enable enables us to kind of look beyond what we understand about like uh, about building, about art. And this actually from like it's coming up from borrowing or like understanding other mediums or imagining new ideas and new techniques. And through these imaginations, now new forms emerge. And these are really, really artistic and really, really abstract. And we can there is a big value of that. It's like we often forget, or maybe something that I want to like talk about a little bit is that the current situation or like the status quo of architecture is based on like form follows function or minimalism. These ideas have actually like uh, were inherited from like the like the Enlightenment age. The ideas where man is a machine, like in Descartes' uh, books and ideas that like you know like they refuse that. Men do, people don't have a soul basically and animals and like human are complex animals and they just need to 
uh, be the design for them as such, like as their machines. And this actually was influential from the Renaissance era and like, you know, the industrialization era that's affected the philosophy of that. And we seem at that point up until now, we seem to have been living in this mentality where everything should be materialized. Everything should have um, a purpose, but not necessarily a meaning because maybe there's no meaning at least. And this actually idea mixed with capitalism and people want to profit more of like of of these idea of of the technology they kind of spoil that into the benefit of the of the few over like the value that is for the all for like for everyone and i think ai what ai kind of gives like or like the democratization the democratization of these tools is what is the added value of art and architecture is like now you have a new perspective now you have new ideas now you don't need to peek and find about like you know function now you can look for meaning or act like look for it not not being present in your own hand but just like go there and explore it and look for it look for new meanings that's that's what i really like about AI. And the processes also are really complex. So the processes of these tools are not really simple. And But on the other hand, because the develop, these tools are developing in a much ever rapid pace, uh, based, uh, rabbit, um, rabbit pace, they are providing people with um, an enormous value or like a very, very big value of creating the unknown or like going and just like, you know, break the rules. Like now, like you don't have to think about budget. You don't have to think about even meaning. You don't have to think about anything. Just like go there and like, you know, do your work. But the processes also, they are like, um, they're they're happening very, very fast. So um, like in this example, it's just like, I think for the, art, for the usual artists or the usual creators, sometimes it takes years and years of them to try to develop their own technique maybe waiting for the technology to arrive maybe they just like need more time but like in a in that rapid environment like you like the process actually evolves almost like every week or every day and that changes your style drastically and um, this has like a couple of like good or bad effects actually uh, like we don't know i think we are at that point where we're just very uncertain about what the future holds um, to us um, and what we were able to do. We just like need to be a little bit brave and just like, you know, face the reality and just like adapt to the technology, but also being very, very critical about it. It's because like these tools allow us to explore endlessly using like only like simple um, strategies. So like all the, the, the variations that you can see right now, uh, they have been like generated from exactly like one or two prompts, but the value was from the variation. So for me, like I'm looking for using AI as a way to um, not to like come up with new ideas, like not like to generate my vision or like execute my vision, but rather to explore and just like go in this vast, vast field of like ideas and just like, you know, go go look for what's there. It's like archaeology. It's called the latent space. Uh, like at, at least like the neural networks has like what they call like a latent space. And the latent space, the way that I look at it, it's not a, it's like a place where all the ideas actually exist and we just have to look for them. So again, it's, there's a lot of things that, that we can just look for if we just gave up about like our ideas about like what we need to create and what, what we need to do. And this is an old example of like how like um, AI is coming so fast. So it's not only 2D, but it's also 3D. Like this is an example of like how you can transform like uh, prompts into 3D. Now it's even like more promising and a lot of people are uh, using text to 3D or even like applying 3D technology into like architecture and practice. But one really interesting question that always haunts me is like how do I understand design and how AI understands it as well? And like, again, where is the value? And for me, it's just, this question brings me to like, I don't know, maybe my childhood or like my, my own country, Egypt, where I think as, as an architect or as a designer, even before I come here to the United States, I've been saturated with ideas about like modernism and Western architecture and Western ideas. And it's because, again, that's what, makes the money, I guess, in, in the entire world. But there is, uh, like, I 
I think like using AI has a great potential in actually understanding where we're coming from, where we're where where we come as an architects or designers, like by studying like ancient ancient history. Uh, for me, like Egyptian architecture is one really fascinating topic because it's very very rich. My customers are very lucky to be an Egyptian architect, and like the value there is um, is just so hard to be missed out. But it's also it's being faced with a lot of obstacles like architectural bias. Sometimes like these uh, tools or software are not able to just produce good images or like, you know, good quality uh, outputs because like you just don't have enough representation in their data sets. And this is actually a big fact, but it's being addressed. So like it was harder for me to generate uh, ancient Egyptian concepts last year. Now it's much easier, but again, it's it's I think it's really important, and again, it comes back to feed. It's feeding back the same loop of like, uh, what what is the current status quo of the uh, status quo of design, and what's what we should do as architects, and what should we investigate. So basically, it's sometimes I look at it and like where the value lies in using generative AI in architecture and design. So like, on on the one hand, you have all these potentials to uh, build on new concepts that are, uh, or like not new concepts, but like the current architectural styles and just integrated with art and design elements. But on the other hand, you can also use generative AI to discuss more important issues that is about, I don't know, global warming or like heritage and how, or like homelessness and how these topics, although they are not really related to like the architectural practice, they will more fall under the architectural philosophy and why we like what's the value in just like showing like a building that looks like a tram it's nothing really like there is no point of like building a tram building that just doesn't make sense but there's another value of like storytelling is that like by trying to combine art and architecture and heritage from like a, a humanistic narrative or like a personal narrative now you have this new output of um of new meanings, like something visual that you can look at it as a designer, and now you can try to judge for yourself, and you can take that and inspire from it, and applying that into uh, your work. So basically, the way I see it is that um, usually architects, like at that point, like over, like reiterating what I've been saying is that architecture has been living in this form full of function of like man is a machine. That's what like the the card or like his followers are saying uh, have been reciting, and we've been dealing with like human beings in the architectural space as assets, but not as actually like human. Like architecture should serve them, but like that the way it, right now the architecture actually like people are serving architecture, but not the other way around. But now it's really interesting because now we have a man that is about to be like sorry a machine that is about to be a man or to be a person so now it's like the whole thing kind of transforming into new weird realm where we don't really understand where this is uh where this is going because we thought hey man is a machine but now the machine is becoming a man so what we need to deal with it and the way that i always think about it is that we need to become more human, <laughs> in my opinion, in the sense of that we need to um, value uh, our needs as human beings, but not only like the materialist uh, value, but also like emotional values. One of them is empathy. We should be empathetic about the whole design practice and, uh, and the whole why we, we build what we build and criticize ourselves with what we, we're building. Because like the whole AI narrative is now shifting into a very, I don't know. I, I, I see a lot of people or like a lot of big firms kind of utilizing AI to um, basically materialize what they have been doing all over. Like again, like reiterating just for the sake of profit, just for the sake of like power. But not a lot of people are actually kind of taking it to step back and like looking at AI as a, a transformative tool for the entire human condition, which is, I think that's kind of my mission is like, you know, like coming back from like a technical world where I used to build everything. And, you know, I've been into this, like, you know, money feeding machine that is trying to consume and consume and just like coming back and see, and just like reflect on 
what we can do now with these new tools. And it's just like, at that point, it's pretty ambiguous, but it's just like um, where's uh, the try. So yeah, that's um, that's it for me. That's everything that I have. It should, I mean, I, I apologize because I made like a much better presentation that Josh have saw, <laughs> but it's kind of crashed last minute. But yeah, it's just like, I mean, I'm trying to conclude everything. All right, fantastic. No, Hassan, that was super, super interesting. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I certainly have a lot of things. Uh, I mean, we, we we started talking a little bit uh, before this. We can, we can certainly uh, continue the conversation. You know, I, I think what's really interesting is what you were talking about, you know, is that a lot of a lot of architecture, you know, like particularly like the brutalist architecture, you know, it it was very much about like, you know, we understand how humanity functions and it was very and it was very spare and functional. Um, and I think there's something kind of interesting about this idea of like now our machines are like so complex that they're 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 almost more like us and they're sort of ineffable in their own way and how they work. Mm -hmm. And now it like it almost makes sense that the architecture should almost follow that as well. You know, it, it should also like it, you know, we we have to sort of like let go of some of the preconceptions of understanding function. Yeah, I, I think we should, yeah. It's um like the the whole thing about like the generative AI is that it has an a big capacity that just new human, no human would ever have. It has like a much bigger capacity. And you, should, you need to keep up with that. And keeping up with that is not by being technical or like using these tools to, again, to reiterate what you've been doing, but actually to try to think about new narratives that can actually, that you can use, that you can employ uh, the AI to just like to, to present it or like to reintroduce new meanings. And one of the things that I really find it like really important is to look for the human aspect, like empathetical aspect where, because again, like we live, I think we live in a very, like in a crazy world with, with a lot of problems. And uh, it's like to AI can to help us like if not help us to solve them they can help us see them you know like it can help us like understand just a glimpse of what they are and uh yeah it, but it just like needs courage and it needs a little bit you know like being skeptical about what you do very cool so uh, Miriam has a question uh Miriam, do you want to ask the question or do you, would you like me to uh, answer for you or ask it for you I'll ask it. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. So Mary, Mary wondered, uh, how can we start and learn how to use the AI in architecture and interior design? So, yeah, how, what's a, what's a good what's a good way into this? Well, it depends on like first of all, we need to define what do you want like AI in architecture and design. That's something that we really need to define first. So, what I've been doing, the work that I've showed you, is not actually their design or architecture, but it's actually more like architectural philosophy. So, but again, like sometimes me and a lot of people are using AI, generative AI to in the conceptualization phase where like people start to um, looking for ideas or search for new ideas. And that's how you employ it, like looking for new ideas and then you implement it like in the traditional ways. But a lot of big firms are using AI in a more bigger capacity where they actually like generate like, you know, documents or like help them like solve like uh, blueprints uh, or sometimes form finding. And to be able to learn that, that's a really complex um, scenario. And um, yeah, I, I can, I don't know if I can, I'm the best person to answer you for that. But like learning AI and like design thinking is like very, very simple. It's just like, you know, you can just go and try. These tools are very, again, they are democratic. There are free versions. Um, they are not hard to learn. They are like the easiest tools that you can learn or like architectural and uh, and uh, like or like modeling uh, software so yeah so it's, uh, it's it's fairly easy to go into just go and try right and and i and i think that there, there's some there's some uh, conversation in the chat um like specifically mid journey stable diffusion runway dolly which, which are the ones that which are the ones that you think are the easiest to kind of get into or they, which are the ones that you use i think mid journey is the easiest one I try to use everything, but like my favorite tools are uh, Stable Diffusion and Midjourney. Not Dali, Dali, not very much. It's like Stable Diffusion is an open source platform. So it has a lot of add-ons and plugins that kind of uh, keeps, um, you know, up, being updated all the time. So there's something new that's coming, that's happening with uh, Stable Diffusion. And it's also free. If you if you want it, you can like install it in your own uh, on your own machines. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's my favorite. But it's, the easiest one is definitely Midjourney. Yeah, uh, and so um, 
actually how do you, i and this is this is my own question i'm just sort of jumping yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, so yeah. like you know just just wondering like sir what for some of the imagery that you showed us like what is that what does that process look like you know like how many like how or do you have like very very sort of long elaborate prompts is there a lot of re you know I, i've used mid journey and there's a lot of like the remixing and refactoring and re-queuing like yeah, yeah, know, yeah. How, like what what does a typical process look like for you uh, I don't think there's a typical one. I, I was ask. I keep asking myself this question. So, like in like in a lot of interviews that I've been doing, I'm also helping a lot of like researchers in a lot of universities, like in MIT and like Cardiff University and a lot of places. And they always ask, ask me about the process. But I'm coming to a point where I think that the process is just doesn't make any sense because it will change. So like I used to have like a process of like having a lot of prompts and like trying to remix and building on different models. But then a newer model will show up and it like everything about it will change or like a new software will show up and everything about it will change. So right now, like my favorite process or like the one that I am kind of investing at is like um, is using a tool called ConfUI. ConfUI is... I don't know this one. What, what, how, do you, how do you spell that? Comfy, so C-O-M-F-Y-U-I. -I. Okay. Cool. So what yeah, you... so... So this is basically, this is a stable diffusion. Um, you can say like interface. So basically it's a stable diffusion uh, model, but it's like a node based. So um, it's instead of like uh, having to type everything. So it's not di directly like text to image, but you have like different components and then you can like connect them together. So you oh. have like your one prompt in one, uh, in one like, I don't know, you can say like a paragraph, like that, like, that's say like a rectangle or a paragraph. And then you can bring in a, a, a model that you want to use. So like the ConfUI allows you to use different models. It's not like Midjourney. Midjourney has their own models, but now you have like an open source model. And then you can decide if you want to upscale that or you want to go to different processing or you have a video that you want to break up and then use like something that's called ControlNet. ControlNet is a technique which is actually like remap your images so like if i have an image of you like control net will analyze the image and then like get the control lines and also get the depth map oh, and now you can generate an image based on that depth map that's how i actually generate like my dancing buildings uh you know like i don't know if you've seen them like the yeah yeah those are beautiful i love it the michael jackson yeah those are fantastic yeah, yeah. so that's how you use it like basically it's control net so yeah comfy ui is like for me, maybe because I'm an architect or because I'm a computational designer, but this is more of a process that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. But again, like I, in my head, I always believe that it's not about the process. Like process is important for the art world. And yeah, of course, but it's ever changing now. So I try to keep my process as flexible as I can. And uh, it, like, even like, even whether if I like it or not, like keeping a process at that point, sometimes becomes obsolete. I only can keep my process for maybe like the like the duration of a certain project. Like I'm working working in a project right now, like for a company in Germany. And I've started this project about two months ago. And now I don't have the ability to actually change the process. I have to be confined in what I'm doing. Although there's a lot of new things that I want to try out, but I have to be confined in that. But once this project is done, I'll throw the pro process away with it and then like learn new things. Very cool. Crazy. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, and uh, Enrique uh, Lattes, I'm sorry, I know I'm going to pronounce that terribly wrong. Do you want to ask your question? Enrique? Enrique? I'm sorry, Enrique. That's how you pronounce it. Enrique. Yeah, I think Enrique. <laughs> Jesus. I, I do this all the time. I, like, oh, I my God. those names. Oh, my God. All right. Especially, like, because I come from Egypt, it's... Oh no no I have I have no I I totally know how to pronounce that all right let me read let me read it for you then uh, uh fantastic Hassan thanks for sharing your presentation I'd like to understand better something you said earlier about a relation with with the AI potent or IA potential I tried using Midjourney with a couple of other online IA tools like. Uh, Prom AI, and I got stuck at a point where I wasn't able to achieve exactly the design I wanted, um, even though I did come up with cool images. I thought of it as a problem, but it seems that 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 this this could be an advantage, or that I misinterpret what you said. No, you didn't. I think that's the whole point of using AI is not to come up with something that is you have a vision for. If you have a vision for oh, something, yeah, and you want to execute it, your only excuse is the speed. Is like. If you want to produce this really, really quickly, other than that, you're just lazy, in my opinion. The 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 whole, I mean, for me, the whole point or like the whole potential of using AI 
is beyond what we already know. So like I only like for me, I'm I don't like any image that's coming out of AI that I am familiar with. I like it when it looks weird, like when it looks new to me. And if it's not, then it's, I don't know, for me, that's not art. You can call it something else, but yeah, like, um, it's, I, I, there's a lot, I, no, I don't want to say that, but it, yeah, that's like the whole, the whole thing about AI is like, you know, to scratch, like, or like to, to unravel uh, or like unreveal layers and layers of hidden potential, not to, you know, like, you know, like say, like to, 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 to see things the same way or like to visualize things that are in your that's in your head unless you're you're looking for like a fast way to do it that's which sad. is like yeah that's legible i mean I, I understand why like sometimes i do like this for quick renderings but that's not that's not how, how i think i should be using ai and like that's not the ultimate goal of using ai it's funny. It's actually not that dissimilar from you know if you if you read the um the abstract expressionists like the abstract uh, abstract expressionists like you know Jackson Pollock or yeah, yeah, yeah. you exactly. know there where where the action paintings were you know they there was there was no way to sort of you know be like okay I'm gonna go like this and then I'm gonna go like this and I'm gonna go, like it, it was it was really about interacting with the medium and then seeing what emerged and then stopping and and you know reassessing and reattack you know it's so it's a it's a it's a similar dance in some ways. Exactly. I, I mean, for me, I don't know, like, become, I, if I want to become a little bit philosophical about it, I think of this thing as like a human experience. You being as a human, you don't want to relive the same thing over and over and over again. You always want to experience something that's new, that's out of your, like, you know, your comfort zone. And the only way to do it is by trying something new and be open up to the possibilities. If you're like, if you limited yourself by what you know, or like what you think you can visualize, then like where's the fun is that in that like yeah that's that's, that's all no I don't know. yeah but it's it's so interesting because i i don't think that process and realism you know or as it's understood has ever really been possible before ai anyway exactly yeah, yeah. well let me here i'll, I'll ask uh, uh nick nick had a question um which Feel free to read or ask for me. Okay, you got it. I am really interested in the evolution of community spaces and how architectural design of the future will fulfill, facilitate human connection in the in a virtual world. How does the relationship between AI and architectural design fit into the bigger picture here when imagining how people interact with physical environments? Um, I think this question is, I don't know. I don't know if it's like a really architectural question. I think what you're asking yeah. is like immersive experiences, right? And this is something that's not necessarily architecture, or maybe like building in the metaverse. If you sort, if you want to talk about it, I don't know. Like, and Nick, like, correct me if I if I understood your question in the wrong way. Um, again, like, we can. I think we can answer that by like looking at the, the like how AI can leverage architecture in general, and then we can say about like how we can use it like in modifying the space. And I don't know if again if I'm. Oh, but you say like physical environments. Okay. How yeah. Do you physical environments? Okay. I know. I was, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. Well, I, I think, yeah. Um, well, I'll, if I you're talking I, about, I'm sorry. Oh, he's going to jump. I think you okay. can hear, I'll, I'll pipe in here to clarify. Yeah I, I, yeah. I think I am imagining, I'm coming from the immersive point of view, but I really, I, I guess the, I'm, I'm getting at like uh, the, the specific function of spaces, I believe will evolve and change over time. Spaces, buildings, architecture exist to serve a, a function in the physical world. And I think in the future, you know, people are using office spaces less. We'll, we'll be shopping in physical spaces less. So the actual function a physical space will serve, I feel uh, like that evolves over time. And, and the actual architectural design of those spaces will evolve to meet different needs of different communal spaces and I, I, I does that and, may, and maybe I'm asking the wrong question um for, for this conversation but um yeah does that clarify in a way but so basically you're talking about the role of AI in immersive spaces in non-physical spaces is that correct uh yes okay well I think at that point is just again to cons conceptualized new forms and meanings. I mean, for me, the way that I look at like the metaverse, I, I don't like like how the metaverse is being built at that point. I think again, it's being built as 
uh, I don't know, an imitation or like an application of the existing architecture that's in the physical world, which for me doesn't make any sense. Why to build something that's already existed in like in the real world, like while you can actually come up with something that's really fantastical. And I think that could be an important role. Again, this is nothing, that's not something that I'm doing or like I'm interested in doing at that point. So I haven't like I, there were several talks like uh, with clients to build some stuff for them in the metaverse, but I never kind of pushed the endeavor any further than just like talking. Um, but for me, it just like if I if I've been I like I've been like in the metaverse. I I, I don't use metaverse very much. Like only I use it like a couple of times for like exhibitions and stuff. And again, like when I'm there, it just like again doesn't make any sense. Why am I looking at a room in a digital space why is it a room why it has walls that doesn't maybe it's it makes sense to feel like a little bit i don't know comfortable like enough to freak out because you like in a new realm but again like ai can help us like push these ideas further and just like again understand what is space but now not only space but like don't say what is digital space but that actually requires a very a big brave and a very critical point of view uh, from designers and architects to be ready to let go of all what they learned about design because design is all about physics, about budget, about everything. And now, like in a world free of constraints, what you will build. And now, and now you don't have the same vocabulary that you use as architect, which is like doors and windows and walls. Now you can build something with emotions. I don't know, like what? How do you visualize emotions or like how do you feel it? Not only like visualize it, but how like through like this like audiovisual sensory, new sensory that you have, how you can push this idea further. So maybe architects are not the best people to build in the metaverse. Maybe in the metaverse needs, I don't know, poets or, you know, like, or artists. Um, uh, yeah, so like, again, like I, in my point of view, architecture with the meaning that we have is kind of meaningless in this uh, world. But this, again, this is like very philosophical. If you went to the business of metaverse, which I know very little about, there's a lot of people that you can like let them, hear them talk about the architecture of the metaverse and it's a real thing. And a lot of people really interested and really interested in that. So they have all these other aspects about how like the metaverse will be a continuation of the outer world and how it will be merged into that at one point. Uh, but I don't know, from my point, or like from my, very little knowledge about the metaverse and very little knowledge about what's happening in that business. I, I, I don't like it. Yeah. So I can, I can kind of ch jump in here a little bit because it's kind of interesting. I was, I went to this uh, conference called AWE. Uh, they have it in Santa Clara every year mm -hmm. and they also have some in Europe and Asia. Um, definitely encourage people to check it out if they're interested in like the metaverse and all that stuff. But I feel like there's like the metaverse, which is like the meta horizon, like the really boring stuff. And then there's like Roblox and like massive gaming and multiplayer gaming engines. Uh -huh. And like, I think what you're already seeing is like in those multiplayer gaming worlds, like, and like stuff like Roblox, but also things that are like on Xbox and stuff like that. Like you're already seeing those places take a lot of cue from AI architecture uh -huh. and starting and starting to like take thing, things that are like what you're creating and making gaming worlds out of them. And I think then you know, like, in some ways, like what is a probably a more immediate metaverse is people like, you know, shoot, you know, playing battles and Fortnite battles around architecture that looks like stuff that like that, that's inspired or produced by people like you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I, again, like, but yeah, like I think AI should be used in a, like changing the whole narrative of how yeah. we visualize our ideas. Like, because even like, even like games are based on like, current architecture to kind of makes you feel like you're in a real world experience. I think that's the whole point. You want to feel like you're in the real world, not in a digital world. And that's why we build and do what we do. But I, I kind of, I don't know. I don't like that. Yeah. Well, it's also funny too, because like, I, I feel like, you know, in some ways this reminds me of like the advent of photography. And it's like when you had like the daguerreotype, like I don't think anyone could have imagined TikTok. So it's yeah, like, exactly. like, how, like, it was like, the, like, I don't think we can even begin to really imagine where this is all going. Exactly. Yeah. It's gonna be really interesting. All right, I'll let I'll, I'll let someone. Add. Um, actually, is that? Do you want to look at the chat? Are there any questions here that you that you uh that you'd want to jump in? We got a lot, so uh, okay. I don't want to be I don't want to so throw my. I'll try. Yeah, I, I do. I don't want to 
in like escape something. So like the first question is like, how can we participate in crafting sustainable design using AI, considering how energy intensive AI generation process is C, uh, CO2, why is am I overthinking it? You're not overthinking it. I don't know if I am the best person to like answer that, but what I can tell you is that like, for example, David Holtz from Midjourney, like Peter Midjourney, he's trying to use a, uh, uh, like uh, networks that is like, you know, like, I don't know, like using renewable energy, for example. So there are some efforts from developers. I'm, I'm sure not everybody. I, I don't know who cares about the environment anymore, to be honest with you, which is like silly. Uh, but um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of endeavors that I like that at least people are declaring that they are trying to use more renewable, renewable energy uh, in like uh, in using like these networks or bu building their like frameworks. But um I, 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 again, to my work, I try to emphasize more in the philosophy of what AI is doing in a more abstract way, but not like your question is more like about like the engineering of it, like, right, right, like very, it's a very technical question that I don't know if I am the best person to answer uh, to. But like the, I keep thinking about it, like it's like you know, like the the impacts of what we do in the events is really really important. But it's the same thing that maybe you shouldn't use cars anymore, right? So if I overthought that process, I wouldn't be able to go to the grocery store. So the best way that I can do it is I don't know, like try to use um, try to use it like in a considerable uh, way, like you know, because it will be aware of it. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I try to make my work about like climate change and like the effects that's happening about the world. So which is sometimes might be very weird because I'm also using a tool that somebody can say that it is producing a lot of CO2. I don't know. So, yeah, I don't think that's an answer. I don't know if I if I have an answer for that. Uh, okay. Uh, so Enrique can talk. I, I hope we answered your question, Enrique. So, so Brinda says, thanks for the presentation. Formful's function is a commonly used term in architecture. Do you think we might stay, reach a stage where function, um, I'm sorry, I can follow form? Okay, where we're able to describe the form and the AI model can optimize the feasible structure to get closer to possible design. So I think architecture sometimes follow form, but actually the form is following budget or following ideology or following anything. And that's what you can see like, in Zaharit's work, like most of like the, even like the Klukas Museum building that I'm working on, like the the form has no particular function. So we already living, are living in that realm. And we are already using tools to try to be very efficient about how to like with, with the structure, structure integrity or even like project management or like other types of like how we want to build these buildings. So um, what I can also tell you is that a lot of the big companies, um, architectural and structural companies are utilizing AI models to optimize uh, the integrity of the structure. So this is actually happening. That's not something that I can tell you that it will happen. This is actually happening. So. Yeah, I was actually, I was going to, there's a, we only have a few more minutes uh, left. So maybe yeah, we'll take yeah. one more question, but I was going to say um, there were some questions about the practice. You know, I, I think you're using AI in some ways to like imagine these sort of like outlandish in some ways, like impractical uh, applications of architecture. But then there's also this whole other side of, of this, which is like the tooling. Like I, I there's this company in Tropic um, and they're using um, AI to figure out how to do like really efficient 3D printing. So like mm -hmm. you can print like really complex, durable structures. And like a lot of it's actually on like the space, you know, the space stations and stuff like that, because it's like where, where you need to produce like big things with like the least amount of, um, you know, the least amount of material. So there's like, uh, there's also these like very practical applications of AI for that yeah, stuff. Exactly. And also there's like, I think people should like make a distinction between like AI and generative AI. So like yeah. AI yeah. has been used for like, uh, it's been, it's used in the social media for efficiency. It's, it's been used on like a lot of things, but like, like generative AI is a little bit different because now it's actually suggesting solutions. That's like actually just ask question. Now it's just solution based on a training. And a certain training. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah, for me, that's why I'm using it just like to look in, a, in a, an abstract or philosophical way in architecture because I feel like not a lot of people are using it in, in a such a way. So I'm not really interested in the engineering part because there are people who are much smarter than me who are dealing with it. Like for me, I'm trying to think it like in a more philosophical way. Okay. So, so, so we have about three minutes left here. So maybe, maybe as a way to kind of like wrap it up, 
Um, you know, like what is like what like what is something that you would like to just sort of like say to the to the people here gathered today? Like, you know, like you know, what should they be follow like should be they be following you? How do they support their your work? What would you like to see them do uh to get involved in this space? You know, I kind of kind of see the floor to you in that way. Yeah. Um I mean, yeah, it's it's really interesting to see how many people are really interested or also vested in like development of AI or learning AI in general. And uh, again, I, I always feel like there's there's a lot of people who think, and maybe they're true, that there's a hype, you know, like just like how NFTs were like, people thought about like it's a hype. So there's like technological hype and everybody's trying to jump into it, try to make a penny out of it, I, I think. And the way that we look, uh, I think we are as uh, only as good as our tools. So if we kind of exploited or misused our tools, we are jeopardizing our like our own direction or, or guidance as human beings. So this is a very powerful tool. And like learning from history, people are like human beings, are, like human species are very stupid when dealing with very powerful tools. We and like use them. And like, you know, like in fueling hatred, hate and greed, and, and want, we want more power, we want more money. And this is a very, this is a very powerful and a collective tool. So this is a tool for everybody. Everybody's kind of taking part of it somehow. And we thought we should really consider that with working with AI. So working with AI, it's, it's just easy now. Whether, whatever you do, you can just use ChatGPT and now you are using AI. So if you, even if you're posting on Instagram, you're, you're using AI. So you're using AI like one way or another. However, not a lot of people are really consider like you don't really consider like the impacts of like using these tools. So we're really like not to influence anybody to do something, but they just like need to think about like the whole generative AI from the broader perspective, you know, and just like make their own minds and your own opinions and like create a lot and learn a lot, but not only about technology, but also about humanity. So I, I don't know. I think what I'm trying to say is that use AI, but try to stay or like try to become more human in the process. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's a great, great way to sum it up. Hassan, thank you so much for joining us. This was really fantastic. Uh, I think I thought this was a really interesting conversation. I know there's like a ton of uh, unanswered questions. Um, maybe email them to me and I'll, I'll see if I can get some of them up onto the site or, you know, share them in some ways. Um, but again, you know, thanks so much. Thanks for joining uh, Future Spaces. Uh, we'll have another one of these next week. For those of you uh, in the States that are celebrating Thanksgiving, have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, Eat well, stay safe, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you guys all again soon. Thanks again, Hassan. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everybody. All right, Bye. Have a great one, everyone. Bye. Bye.